Okay, well, we'll get back to reality here. Helen? Well, we're beginning 2 Timothy this morning. Uh, 2 Timothy. One of my second favorite books in the Bible. Actually, they're all my favorites. I have a hard time deciding. You say that every time. All right. 2 Timothy, actually, it's better because it's only got four chapters. It's, it's easier to read. For people that don't like to read, you can start in 2 Timothy. Hey. Well, Second Timothy is an important letter. Yeah. It's a good thing too because the place is freezing. My toes are like do you think we can get started now? The importance of the book of 2 Timothy. As Baxter says, this book is particularly important because it's the last writing that we have from the hand of Paul. Not only is it still just as practical in its personal and church applications as 1 Timothy, but... It shows us his attitudes as a, a man just about ready to exit this world and enter the next. When all is said and done, you don't find the Apostle Paul a very discouraged, disillusioned, frustrated, angry individual. Far different from another character that I read of in the scriptures. Can you think of another person who at the end of his life was frustrated, sad, disillusioned? It, it makes a, for a very interesting contrast in attitudes or studies. And if there's any other reason why 2 Timothy is important, because it's, it's, it's this. Or if there's no other reason, this is reason enough to, to emphasize 2 Timothy. And that is that it shows that Serving the Lord pays. You don't have regrets when you serve the Lord. When all is said and done, I much prefer uh, putting up with uh, this battle that I have with my flesh and, and continually seeking the Lord's face and uh, seeking to do my best as a husband and as a father and as a spiritual leader and as an example to other people and a witness and just trying to remain faithful to the Lord regardless of how my life turns out. Much prefer doing that in my in my own mind when I consider that what I w would feel like if I chose to rebel against the Lord, like people I know. When all the fun's over, then you pay. Payday someday. And the end result is uh, a tremendous lesson that we could, if we need to learn. And Second Timothy shows us the end result of a life served for the Lord. And for that reason, the book is very important. The purpose of the book. Second Timothy was written to strengthen the charge of the first letter. In this book, we don't have so much a charge as we do a challenge. You can charge someone with a responsibility, give them some responsibility. That's essentially what we read in First Timothy, whereas in Second Timothy, to re-emphasize that responsibility, that original commission, to lay emphasis on it, to reiterate it, to pound on the table, <laughs> you know, make your point, is, is really the thrust of this book. And I think that's why Paul wrote it to Timothy, to challenge him to fortitude and faithfulness, because he knew that his time of testing was not yet done. At the time that Paul wrote to 2 Timothy, both Paul and Timothy were obviously alive. <clears throat> Church history tells us that Timothy took Paul's words to heart and died a martyr's death in Ephesus at the hands of an angry mob. And so Paul's purpose was realized, in fact. Don't even need to talk about the authorship or authenticity of the book. Um, 
no one denies, even the most radical critics don't really deny the Pauline authorship of this book or the fact that it's authentic because it fits so well historically with uh, the book of Acts and, and with its relationship to First Timothy and Titus. So we'll move on from the authorship to the historical background, the occasion for the date of writing. In terms of the date of the writing of the book, Robertson says that Second Timothy was written from Rome probably in the early autumn of 67 or the spring of 68 A.D. This is after the burning of Rome and yet still in a time period in which um, the Christians in, in Rome are being persecuted under the Neronian persecution. If the pastoral epistles are genuine, uh, they come between the dates 65 and 68 AD. Bartlett argues for a date before 64, accepting the view that Paul was put to death then, but it is far more probable in uh, Robertson's view that Paul met his death in Rome in 68 AD, shortly before Nero's death, which was in June of 68. So this would make it the fall of 67 or the spring of 68. If you, uh, you want to get a sense of uh, Paul's mindset, the, uh, the Apostle Paul refers to his bonds, uh, to his... to his loneliness in jail. Verse 15 in chapter 1, This thou knowest, Timothy, that all they who are in Asia turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. The Lord give mercy to the house of Onesiphorus, for he oft refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chain, but when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. And so this man looked Paul up in jail, and brought him some things to help him. Paul says in verse 9 and 10 of chapter 2, for which I suffered trouble, for Christ, I suffered trouble as an evildoer, even to bonds, but the word of God is not bound. Therefore I endure all things for the elect's sake, that they may also obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus. Then in chapter 4 of this book, at the end of the book, uh, Paul has an expectant attitude. He's expecting to die. He says in verse 6, I am now ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. He can see the handwriting on the wall. I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith, and I'm expecting to see the Lord, he says. He says also that um, in verse 13 and following that he left his cloak in Asia at Troas with a friend of his which he wanted Timothy to go get and bring to him he also wanted books and especially the parchments he says in verse 13 it's a document on uh, leather or uh, papyrus uh, he alludes in verse 16 of chapter 4 to the fact that he had already had one court appearance. At my first defense, no man stood with me, but all men forsook me. I pray God that it may not be laid to their charge. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by me the preaching might be fully known, and that all the Gentiles might hear, and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. And so... Paul is obviously writing from a standpoint between his first court appearance and his second court appearance uh, at which he was probably condemned and church history said that he was beheaded by Nero. All right. <clears throat> 
and that would have had to have been before 68 AD because everybody there's a well-known secular historically historical date as to Nero's death <clears throat> so to summarize Baxter says that the book of 2nd Timothy was written soon after the first letter Paul was in prison now in Rome and he did not expect as he did in his earlier letter to be freed again uh, except to be freed from this life to be with Christ why did Paul write the letter what was the occasion he probably sensed his own approaching death we can see that in chapter 4 he had a sensitive concern for Timothy he wanted to strengthen him he wanted one more time to review the significant facts and experiences known to both of them both Paul and Timothy had shared a great deal this is nowhere better illustrated than in chapter 3 where Paul says Timothy you have fully known my teaching my manner of life my purpose my faith my long suffering my love my patience my persecutions my afflictions which came to me at Antioch at Iconium at Lystra your own hometown Timothy or neighboring town what persecutions I endured but out of them all the Lord deliver me so he alludes to the long-standing relationship that he has had with Timothy he probably wanted to leave several final and lasting key imperatives in Timothy's mind being certain that he would not see him again in my own thinking I sort of would draw an analogy to the to a scenario suppose that you knew that you had cancer and, the, and you know it was pretty evident to everybody around you and yourself that you had a couple of weeks to live you know a month if I knew that right now while my kids were small I would probably do something like Paul did for Timothy I would write each of my children a letter a personal letter you know and explain to them the choices that I had made in my life and why I why I made those choices and and then that I would encourage them to make good choices and, and remind them of the key issues that I considered that they would have to deal with in their own personal lives in the days to come and you know just give them some real basic warnings and a personal testimony and a reason for following the Lord and I think that that should be part of every Christian parent's will you know we never know when we're going to go and uh, what a precious thing it would be for a child to have a letter written directly to them by a parent that had only them in mind you know before they died as part of their preparations for death you know this becomes one of the most significant letters that Paul wrote simply for that reason this is the last thing he said everything that you put the last person last things that a person says are significant usually you want it you want it to be meaningful you know you don't want any superfluous stuff there it's all important you know so what are you going to say what did Paul say well the things he said in these four short chapters of, are of great significance the key personalities in the book of 2nd Timothy like 1st Timothy um, Paul stresses apostates and heretics he names names here Phygelus, Hermogenes, Hymenaeus, Philetus, Demas, a former disciple, Alexander, a businessman over in Greece or Ephesus, other unnamed individuals in chapter 3, verses 8 and 9. Um, Paul is obviously referring here in, in 3, 8, and 9 to people that are known both to him and Timothy, but he doesn't name their names. He says, Now just as Janes and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith, but they shall proceed no farther. Um, all of us have acquaintances that we have good ideas about uh, perhaps we never really talked to them but we've heard about them 
such was true between Paul and Timothy. And he alludes to these people who are in error. On the other side, in these books, there are great commendations and encouragement given, uh, reminders to follow the example of good people like Eunice and Lois, Onesiphorus, Cretans, Titus, Luke, Mark, Tychicus, Priscilla and Aquila, Erastus, Trophimus, Eubulus, Pudens, Linus, Claudia, and others. If you go through there, it's quite a list of names there of, uh, of people that are on the right team instead of the wrong team. I would simply like to make one comment in that. I think it's unavoidable. This is kind of a, an application or a devotional point. I think it's unavoidable that we as Christians are involved in a them versus us mentality. You have to, you have to have that kind of a mentality if you're a Christian. It's true in one sense that we're all sons and daughters of the living God. We're all in the brotherhood of men. We're all creatures. Uh, we have in common things with every unbeliever in the whole world, you know, bodies and the concerns of the planet and all this stuff. You know, the fact we have one life, three score and ten, social issues, personal issues of, you know, morality, everything confronts everybody the same way. But in our own personal experience, believers are really in common only with the household of faith. And so it's us versus those outside of that body. It's them outside and us within. And if a Christian isn't willing to live realistically in, uh, in terms of uh, this mentality of them versus us, well then uh, there will be no proper biblical separation or whatever. That doesn't mean you're, that, that because we know and recognize this them versus us mentality that we hate them and love us. <laughs> you know, of course not. Christ said that uh, by this shall all men know that you are my disciples if you love one another. So there ought to be a love for one another, but then we're supposed to love our enemies too. So treat everybody the same way, but we know there's a difference between them and us. Again, I'm going to ask you to look for the key words and verses and outlines for the book of 2 Timothy. I'll give you the themes of the book. <clears throat> well, Schofield says that the theme of 2 Timothy is holding the truth. Baxter says the theme of 2 Timothy is the true minister and his reactions. Uh, to error and to his own circumstances. The true minister and his reactions. He also calls it a challenge to fortitude and faithfulness. I, I would call the theme of uh, 2 Timothy how to endure through suffering. If you want a good outline to the book of 2 Timothy, Baxter has a good one. Lockyer has a good one. I didn't look up Phillips. S. Clock has a good one. <laughs> but he's not published, so you'll just have to get the other ones. Now, what do you think about uh, Timothy's relationship, 2 Timothy's relationship to the book of to the rest of Scripture? I think I mentioned this under 1 Timothy, but it's worth repeating. Herbert Lockyer has a 
a nice quotation. He says, in the first book of Timothy, we have the ideal church that every pastor ought to have, stressing what the church is supposed to be like. It's supposed to be a place where there's good teaching, where there's uh, meaningful prayer, where there's the proper roles, where there's good leadership, where there's exposure of error, where there's concern for the weak and helpless in the church, where there's a sharing of assets. Those are all the major themes in First Timothy and uh, describe what the ideal church is like. He says that Second Timothy, on the contrast, shows us the ideal pastor that every church ought to have. And so Second Timothy focuses on the individual who is in leadership. And it's true. I will give you one key word to the books of First and Second Timothy. It's the little word thyself. And when you look at the word thyself, in these books you will find the major the major exhortations are given to Timothy. See if I can't find an example here. Study to show thyself approved unto God. Um, there's several in First Timothy. Um, keep thyself pure. Exercise thyself to godliness. Give thyself to the study of the word. Take heed to thyself, save thyself, behave thyself. <laughs> over and over, you have instructions by, from Paul to Timothy on his own personal responsibilities. Again, I remind you of the difference between a second person imperative and a third person imperative. Right? The second person commands in these two books are, are for the preacher himself. He must do it. That's the responsibility of the leadership of the church by application, whereas the third person responsibilities or imperatives are the responsibilities that the church leader is to implement and see that believers as a whole exercise those duties, third person commands. And we still, we still see that same thing in 2 Timothy. So, A.T. Robertson reminds us once again of the historical relationship of the books that Paul has written. 50 to 51 A.D., the earliest group, you have the eschatological books, 1 and 2 Thessalonians. 54 to 57 A.D., you have the uh, soteriological books, 54 to 57. Uh, the soteriological books, First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, and Romans, sixty-one to sixty-three A.D. You have the Christological books, Philemon, Colossians, Ephesians, and Philippians. And this present book, 2 Timothy, fits into the final category of books that Paul wrote in 65 to 68, the ecclesiological books, the pastoral epistles, 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. Oh, and I would, uh, when you're talking about the relationship of 2 Timothy to the rest of Scripture, I would just compare, uh, by way of contrast, 2 Timothy to Ecclesiastes in the Old Testament where you find Solomon's embittered reminiscences. Um, he thinks back on his failures. He recognizes that he has wasted his life. Instead of anticipating seeing the Lord as Paul does, 
Instead, instead of being able to look back with satisfaction and say, I fought a good fight, I'm, you know, there's a crown of righteousness laid up for me, um, I love his appearing. Instead of anticipating being with the Lord, Solomon is browbeating himself for all of his stupidity, <laughs> you know, and living a life to the flesh. So 2 Timothy is cert certainly a contrast to Ecclesiastes. Sure. Any comments or questions thus far? Well, let's talk about the Christology of the book of Second Timothy. There are about a dozen references to Christ in Second Timothy. We haven't been doing this very consistently, unfortunately, in all the books that we've been studying. But almost every book of the Bible has something to teach us either directly, and I believe that all books of the Bible have something to teach us at least indirectly about the person of Christ. In fact, that's what it says, does it not in Hebrews? In the volume of the book, it is written of me, I come to do thy will, O God. Uh, Jesus spoke to the disciples on the road to Emmaus. And he opened to them in all the scriptures and the law, prophets, and the writings, things concerning himself. Every book of the Old Testament. I don't think that's too far or too extreme. Yeah, well, that's what I mean. It doesn't teach us anything directly, but indirectly there is, if in nothing else, you see a negative image of Christ. Like Ecclesiastes, for example. That's, that's one quotation I remember reading that um, in the sad state of Solomon's, in the, in the um, in the negative, in the negatives that we see of Solomon's own personal example exemplified in Ecclesiastes, if nothing else, we see the void of righteousness that there obviously must exist somewhere. The perfect man who has not. You know, if by nothing else, you see the negative image rather than the positive image of Christ. Now, many books give us a positive image. Isaiah gives us all kinds of things positively about Christ. But the negative image is like, you know what I mean by negative image in photography? You know, the positive image is, is, uh, is what you get back in the mail. You know, a, neg a, a negative is, uh, is the... Is, is the actual film itself that's been exposed to the light and all the darks are white and all the whites are dark. It's the exact opposite. So to use that as analogy of uh, scriptures giving us a neg sometimes giving us a negative image of the person of Christ. By comparison, if nothing else. It's there. But 2 Timothy is giving us a positive image. Chapter 1, verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, according to the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Sometimes I think we kind of overlook a lot of things that are, that are important to us. You know, good to remind ourselves of devotionally. Uh, Christ is Paul's sender. He's the one, he's, Paul is an apostle of Jesus Christ. Turn that around. What is Jesus? Jesus is the one that sent Paul. Right? Paul is his apostle, one sent forth. So Jesus sends us. If you think about that, that's literal in Paul's case. Where did Paul receive his commission? Sure. Um, struck dumb on the road and blind. Paul carried this, carried that experience with him for the rest of his life, to the end of his life. And this last book is still there. Who am I? Very first thing, I am sent of Christ. And that's why he alludes to the fact that I, that my first defense, at least I was able to preach the gospel to kings, to kings. And he's harping back to his Damascus commission where Paul said, or where God said to Ananias in Acts chapter 9, verse 15 and 16, that I have 
picked this man. He's a chosen vessel of mine to stand before kings and princes to preach the gospel. So Christ is the great sender. He's also the life giver, the promise of life which is in Christ Jesus. Of course, that fits perfectly with Colossians chapter 4. Christ is our life. Uh, Christ is the source of mercy and grace. He's also Lord with the Father. Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. So we get grace from Christ, we get mercy from Christ, we get peace from Christ. And he's also described as Jehovah, from Christ our Lord. Again, the great significance of this title of Christ as Lord is that that means boss, controller, master. Employer, dictator. You know, in every sense of the word, he is our should be, and and of course he gives us the option. Wasn't it first Timothy called himself a bond slave? Where's that reference? Well, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 1, he says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord. Actually, he wasn't the Lord's prisoner. He was the, the Roman's prisoner. But he called himself the prisoner of the Lord. In other words, even the fact that he was in jail earlier at his first imprisonment, he attributed that to the sovereignty of God. You know, if that's what the Lord wants, so be it. All right? It's, it's a good example. I thought there was another place where he called himself a bond slave of Jesus Christ. I can't lay my fingers on it at the moment. The reason I wanted to find that reference is because if we, if we interpret the Bible historically, like we were talking about in our theology class, this morning, if we interpret the Bible historically, that is in terms of its historical frame of reference, what do you know about Roman slaves? They were, yes, they were considered chattel property, but one significant point. Pardon? Yes, and indeed, a master could change a slave's position in society. There were actually four levels of slavery. The bottom level is where they were nothing more than property. But depending on the master that you had, you could, uh, you could eventually purchase your own freedom and become a free man, which was many times worse than being a slave. Because in that society, a free man had no legal recourse, and if he w couldn't pay his bills, he could be sold into slavery again. But a slave at least had food to eat every day and had the security of being in a house. You know? so, but anyway, the point I'm making is that Paul called himself a bond slave, uh, and I can't find the spot here. I thought it was in Second Timothy, but... But anyway, uh, in Roman society, if a master, excuse me, if a slave was given his amanuet, uh, amanuet? emancipation, not amanuensis, his emancipation, that was a legal document, you know, that had to be signed at, uh, usually at a pagan temple, you know, in the presence of the priests. And it was... Um, 
he was basically given to the gods and he was free to go he could be given his freedom if if he had done if he saved his master's life or something and the master wanted to give him his freedom he could but if the slave loved his master in Roman society he could go to his master and say I want to forfeit my emancipation and I want to be your bond slave forever in other words lock myself eternally into this position and that was done by putting his ear on the doorpost and driving a hole through his ear and giving him an earring and that meant that he was a slave to his master a bond slave not just any old slave but forever and ever and usually a slave like that was given great responsibility and exalted highly in the household and sometimes even given um, given the inheritance if the master didn't have a son a legitimate heir to his master's stuff he could he could be get, become the heir of his master so when Paul calls what? I think he did yeah. that's what Blair says he's our authority this morning but I mean it the, sense, like, why would yeah, it would just heal over. Yeah. Well, I don't know they use an awl, you have a deer over Yeah, depending on the size of the awl, right. Let's let's move onward here. Um, the point I'm, I'm trying to make is that when when Paul refers to Christ as his Lord, I mean, this he actually, in all actuality, this is a point that we would miss unless you understand Roman society. He had become a bond slave to Christ. He had given him everything. Lock, stock, and barrel. And he was about to be pierced through in his flesh. You know. He was going to sign it over with his own blood. You know, to that extent. He'd already done it mentally. He had already had the stripes. He'd already been persecuted in stone and all of this and he alludes in the book of Colossians I believe to the fact that he was filling up in his own body the sufferings of Christ he was his master's slave and Christ was his master quite a different attitude to Christianity and to discipleship than many so-called Christians today you know that we're, it's a hard thing for us to contemplate giving up all for Christ our health privileges and freedoms that we enjoy in the West our family members it really is a sobering thing when you think that the early Christians gave up their families, you know, gave up their husbands and wives, their children. You read Fox's Book of Martyrs, like John was referring to the other night. Young young girls, you know, that had that were newly married and had babies and stuff, you know, they would walk up there and confess Christ, and be burned to the stake, you know. That sort of dedication is almost nil in our society, really. You can't get people to come to church you know you can't get them to give up the televisions you know you can't people won't give money to the lord's work how many how many christians do you know that actually live a hand-to-mouth existence because they're giving everything beyond their necessities to the lord's work not very many and uh, to that to that extent christ is not really lord you know i don't think it's uh a mistake. I don't think it's un insignificant that Paul in his last letter refers to Jesus Christ this way. His Lord, giver of life, one that sent him forth. Uh, chapter 1, verse 9, he refers to Christ as being in the world before, before the world began. So he's eternal, pre-existence. Uh, Life-giving Savior, chapter 1, verse 10, who has come and abolished death destroyer of death he certainly reiterates the resurrection of Christ chapter 2 verse 8 remember that Jesus Christ of the seed of David was raised from the dead according to my gospel that's a curious way to describe Christ because re referring to him as the seed of David stresses his humanity and stresses that this is a human being that was raised from the dead so Paul clearly believed what the Jehovah's Witnesses don't believe that Jesus was a true man, bodily raised from the grave. Ortho, ortho, <coughs> Orthodox Christianity recognizes the true fundamental humanity of Christ and a bodily resurrection. As Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 10, For this cause suffer we persecutions, 
and endure all things. How does he put it? Same thing. For therefore we both labor and suffer reproach because we trust in the living God who is the Savior of all men. It's a living God. So the doctrine of Christ that Paul had certainly contradicts rationalists, German rationalists that we've been talking about in Christology and uh, humanists. Christ is our sphere of service in the Christian living. Chapter 3, verse 13. Evil men and seducers shall become, excuse me, verse 12. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. If it's true that wherever we go, Christ is with us, as he said, Lo, I am with you always, then you could say that basically we live in Christ. He's our whole sphere of existence. Everywhere we go, whether it's in bed or in a far-flung country, in the pulpit or in the car, in a crowd or in the solitary confines of our you know, existence, He is with us always. So Christ is our whole sphere. Chapter 3, verse 15 is the object of saving faith. Salvation through faith which is in Christ Jesus. He's the locus of our faith, the object. And not inconsistently. I think that it's quite significant that almost Paul's last reference to Jesus Christ in his last book in chapter 4 verse 1 is to him as a sovereign I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing and his kingdom see Paul was anticipating seeing the king be entering that kingdom and uh, in the present you know we, we too are in the same situation it hasn't changed in 2,000 years, we anticipate seeing Christ as King. It's a tremendous hope. I'm looking forward with great anticipation to that kingdom wherein dwelleth righteousness and justice, as Peter described, where the King of Kings and Lord of Lords is going to come down during the tribulation with his, on his white charger and with his 10,000 saints, and he's going to just wipe out the opposition. What a time. Paul's Christology carried him through. Verse 18 of chapter 4, The Lord shall deliver me from every evil work, and he will preserve me to his heavenly kingdom, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord is described not only as a reigning sovereign in his kingdom, but a delivering sovereign, intervening even in these. I don't believe that the Lord Jesus Christ delivered Paul from... Well, let me... I, let me re, re, retract that statement. I do believe that Jesus Christ, as Paul's Lord, preserved him from evil works by allowing him to experience the sword. You know, when they used that halberd to cut off his head, that was God's way of delivering him from any more evil works. You know, you could even say that death itself is the Lord's means of delivering us from a lot of stuff. Right? A lot of people would look at that askance. But in the same breath, he preserves his people to his kingdom. Neat. Well, in our next class, we'll uh, start working our way through Second Timothy from first to last. And be doing your researches, please. <laughs>